Welcome back one and all. Recently I was able to purchase the PC Gamer UK magazine, June edition, and like we spoke about in the previous video, this magazine features an entire section dedicated to Nightingale, and it's our time to dive right in. In the late 1800s, towering metal pylons loom over the Victorian city of Nightingale. In this alternate history timeline, ancient mystical creatures from another realm known as the Fae revealed themselves to the world in the 1500s. Just for reference, it was mentioned in earlier article interviews that the lore surrounding this game is largely inspired by Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, a pretty popular book but was also made into a TV adaptation. When the Fae introduced themselves to us in Nightingale, we officially got introduced to magic. The Nightingale City became the new center of the world as people flocked to it to learn the ways of arcane sorcery and put it to use in science and industry. During this time, magical portals were opened and human explorers known as realm walkers began stepping through them to explore unknown worlds. But in the present time, this portal network collapses and with thus cut off from the city of Nightingale, we'll have to repair and explore strange new lands through this portal network to make our way back to the center. We'll be coming across new resources, new discoveries, and most importantly, a crap ton of treasure. The cataclysmic event that caused the destruction of the portal network happened around 1889. This event was caused by something called the Pale that invaded our world. To flee its destruction, humans across the planet attempted to use their portals to reach a relative safety of Nightingale. But the portal network had already been destroyed. Instead of arriving at the city, we stepped out of our portals and found ourselves trapped in the Fey Realms with no ways of returning home. The next section of this magazine is titled, Fashion and Function. The Victorian style is certainly potent in the concept art, screenshots, and footage that was showcased during the interview conducted for this Nightingale magazine segment. Yes, we'll be killing angry boars and stripping their hides with a knife like in any other survival game, but we won't wind up being dressed in crude leather rags and a loincloth in Nightingale. Our realm walkers may be stranded in a savage world of monsters and magic, but we'll still have access to some of the fanciest of attire. We'll be taking our collected resources to an old-fashioned sewing machine and creating dapper waistcoats, bowler hats, and a bustle gown. The basics of survival are familiar. Trees need to be chopped for wood and berries need to be picked for sustenance, but this is a particularly stylish gas lamp fantasy. While a lot of details are still under wraps and many features are still in the works or not fully fleshed out, they confirm here that Nightingale plans to support up to 10 players co-op in a single game when it launches in early access at the end of 2022. This is pretty big if it's true, because yes we knew that Nightingale would be co-op, but for a while there it started to seem as if we would only have access to 4 people total per game session, especially because the partnership with Improbable had dropped in favor of Tencent, so that meant that the game might no longer have access to the IMS tools that are known for trying to scale player accounts. They also confirm in this section that no PvP is planned for Nightingale, although that part we knew. This is a strictly co-op affair, more along the lines of Valheim. We can also play solo, although they state that from the looks of the boss monsters they've been shown, with the code name Apex Creatures, bringing a couple people for the battle sounds like a really good idea. In the next section, known as Boss Level, they officially introduce one Apex Creature known as Ishmael. This is a massive leathery swamp beast capable of turning ranged combat into a melee affair by crossing the distance with a single leap. The second one is another one we're very familiar with, the giants with shaggy beards and feet big enough to flatten an entire building. We've seen these creatures at multiple points during the game trailers and showcases, and we do know that we'll be coming across them and potentially have to defend ourselves, but there will be a degree of choice involved. Not every encounter with these giants has to be a hostile one as we've come to learn, and for the third, they were shown the concept art of a massive bronze entity with four arms and a clockwork head that looks as if it could serve as a god to a race of copper robots. Sounds highly familiar to the Dwemer of Elder Scrolls or even the Grand Tribunal from Marvel. A quote from Neil Thompson, the art and audio director for Nightingale, states that they have had this concept within Fey mythology. This apex creature isn't necessarily a machine, because the Fey would never do something as crass as build something that requires gears and fuel. They call them automations, and the bloodlines that built them have long since passed into obscurity, but the automations themselves still exist within some of the realms. But not all encounters with the creatures of these realms need to end in violence. There may be peaceful solutions that can be explored instead of simply solving every problem you come across by unleashing a shotgun blast. They say that as much as possible, they want to offer multiple ways to solve one of these encounters. So in the quest lines we take, we might get something that says, bring me something back from the giant, and perhaps you could trade the giant for it, or you could try to kill the giant and take it. These choices might even have long-term consequences in terms of how an NPC might ultimately act with you. 
For the next section, we've got the one known as History Channels. There are some NPCs in Nightingale that we might recognize from our own history books. Nellie Bly, for example, was an American journalist in the late 1800s who, among other accomplishments, traveled around the world in 72 days by steamship and railroad, setting a world record. In this section, they also show us a wish list of other 19th century celebrities they'd like to implement. We can see people like Alexander Graham Bell, Louis Pasteur, Isabella Bird, and even Charles Darwin. These are just some of several historical figures they want to or already have in the world of Nightingale. Mary Curry is also in the game too, and according to Neil Thompson, there are many other NPCs we'll be coming across just the same. Some NPCs will serve even more of a purpose than just historical flavor and quest giving. This is where they confirm that while this feature won't be available immediately upon early access, it's planned that NPCs will be recruitable and can help you build and service the structures you build. You don't have to necessarily do all the work yourself, Flynn says, so I guess that means we might not be able to have them fight for us or help us around the place just yet, unless something changes. Just try not to think of these NPCs as simple hired hands or soulless robots who complete a list of chores. They'll be more like companions in RPGs. We gotta remember that some of this team worked on games like Dragon Age, so I'm expecting and crossing my fingers that there will be a relationship system for each of these companions like we saw in those titles. For the next section titled Portal Wars, they start by saying the ultimate goal for players is to find a way to open a portal back to the city of Nightingale, but many other portals will need to be opened first. They confirm that Nightingale itself as a location will not be available when the game enters early access. Within the Fey Realms, players will be able to open magic doorways to new areas and discover zones that harbor new resources. Players can expect to open gateways to tropical jungles, desert biomes, murky swamps, and whatever bizarre dimension the giant bronze clockwork creature resides in. Naturally, base building is also a big part of the experience, but to match your fancy clothing, they're called estates, not bases. You don't have to clear out a spot of land and build your estate from scratch either. Long before the cataclysm that stranded us here, other explorers were visiting these realms. You might come across an earlier realm walker camp and be able to sleep in their bedroll. There are also existing structures in the world, places that others have built that you can co-op and build alongside your estate. The last section for us dives into something we talked about during the last video, the hope system. While you contend with some familiar survival systems in Nightingale, like keeping your health up and protecting yourself from heat or cold in different environments, there's another meter players will contend with built on an entirely different notion than physical survival. And so we have to manage that hope through the dangerous parts of the realm as we go exploring. An example of a similar game that uses a hope system is a game known as Frostpunk. This reflects the mood of your citizens in the post-apocalyptic city builder, but in Nightingale, it's focused on the individual player. In the demo the interviewer is shown, a character is chopping trees and gathering resources, and during this, the bar is barely filled. But in another clip, the bar is entirely empty. So despite the survival bars traditionally being grounded more in the physical, hunger, health, etc., they now want to bring in one that speaks more to the psychological. And that is officially all the details we received during the PC Gamer Magazine segment of Nightingale. Have a wonderful night or day, folks, and farewell. Ciao.